Even today, it makes me a bit uneasy. I mean, I'm all for equal rights, but how is it that one who is working hard is told that she is in the wrong? After all, she is being selfless in providing what is needed and desired by Jesus and the other guests. This is similar to the problem many have with the story of the prodigal son. There we see a son that has been dutiful and worked to further his father's interest, and he is told that the returning son, who has been dissolute and lazy, should be given the finest clothes and food to acknowledge his return to his status as the beloved son. Whereas the other son feels that his father has never shown such joy and preferential treatment to him in all the years of his loyalty. What is Jesus telling us? What is he trying to do with all these off-the-wall responses? Is it possible that he's trying to emphasize or get our attention that the conventional way of life or thinking is not necessarily the standard by which Christians must live? Is he suggesting that the priority in life is the desire and commitment to follow Jesus and living by his teachings? Is he directing us to see that if we take care of this aspect of life as the priority, we will be given the guidance, strength, and hope we need to deal with our earthly concerns? His response that Mary's choice is the better one, that she has chosen one that cannot be taken away, says to me that all other priorities, in other words, earthly concerns, are fleeting. Martha had taken away the opportunity to escape her pain and continued to suffer due to her persistence of clinging to that traditional view of what was proper or right. This is one important lesson Jesus is trying to highlight. Because it has been done this way, or others expect certain things from us, it's not necessarily what God's plan for us is. Equal rights for the races, child abuse prevention, Education for women are examples of, of beliefs that were not sanctioned by society at one time. But they are values that most people of today would agree are unquestionably correct and morally right. Jesus wants his people to look for what is right and move beyond the accepted and traditional paths. The second way that the suffering is self-inflicted is the emotional strictures that she experiences similar to that loyal son in the story of the prodigal son. She is jealous, looking for things to be fair. Jesus tries to break her out of this limited perception and see that he will not be drawn into this petty type of conflict. He tries to help her see that he values her service, but that he is most pleased by placing the spiritual connection as the priority. He wants to instruct that the time spent at his feet, listening and learning about what he wants for us, is far more valuable than anything else that we might seek or do in life. It is through this connection that we will receive the gift of peace and spiritual rest. We have been separated from God by the ways of the earth, whether it be through our busyness or through the lore of earthly and material satisfaction. The opportunity to find relief from our pain and limit our suffering is when we put the spiritual aspect of our lives first. We must learn to bring our whole selves to God without reservation and learn to trust and rely on God. And I have a story that I'd like to share with you that helped me to see how intensely I must trust that God's care is there for me in order that I can put aside my human concerns. The story is called, Are You Going to Help Me? In 1989, an 8.2 earthquake almost flattened Armenia, killing over 30,000 people in less, than 40, in less than four minutes. In the midst of utter devastation and chaos, a father left his wife securely at home and rushed to the school where his son was supposed to be, only to discover that the building was as flat as a pancake. After the traumatic initial shock, he remembered the promise he had made to his son, no matter what, I'll be there for you. And tears began to fill his eyes as he looked at the pile of debris that once was a school. It looked hopeless, but he kept remembering his commitment to his son. He began to concentrate on where he walked his son to the class at school each morning 
remembering his son's classroom would be in the back right corner of the building. He rushed there and started digging through the rubble. As he was digging, other forlorn parents arrived, clutching their hearts, saying, my son, my daughter. Others well-meaning parents tried to pull him off what was left of the school, saying, it's too late. They're dead. You can't help. Go home. Come on. Face reality. There's nothing you can do. You're just going to make things worse. To each parent, he responded with one line. Are you going to help me now? And then he proceeded to dig for his son, stone by stone. The fire chief showed up and tried to pull him off of the school's debris, saying, fires are breaking out. Explosions are happening everywhere. You're in danger. We'll take care of it. Go home. To which the loving, caring Armenian father asked, are you going to help me now? The police came and said, you're angry, distraught, and it's over. You're endangering others. Go home. We'll handle it. To which he replied, are you going to help me now? No one helped. Courageously, he proceeded alone because he needed to know for himself, is my boy alive or is he dead? He dug for eight hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, and then in the 38th hour, he pulled back a boulder and heard his son's voice. He screamed his son's name, Armand. He heard back, Dad, it's me, Dad. I told the other kids not to worry. I told them that if you were alive, you'd save me. And when you save me, they'd be saved. You promised, no matter what, I'll always be there for you. You did it, Dad. You did it. What's going on in there? How is it, the father asked. Well, there are 14 of us left out of 33, Dad. We're scared, hungry, thirsty, and thankful you're here. When the building collapsed, it made a wedge like a triangle and saved us. Come on out, boy. No, Dad. Let the other kids out first, because I know you'll get me. No matter what, I know you'll be there for me. Powerful, powerful story. And if we keep in mind that God is always there for us and that if our first priority is to focus on him and live our lives as Jesus did, we will not avoid pain, but we can reduce unnecessary suffering in ourselves and in the world around us. This is the hope we are given. Instead of being busy fixing situations and trying to do what I think is right, I need to become quiet and seek guidance to learn what Jesus would guide me to do. We will never do this perfectly, but we must be committed to practicing this in all of our lives. If you join me in prayer. Father, when I took at my, took, look at my own life, I'm often too busy to just listen to you. I'm an activist. I'm always wanting to be doing something. I actually have trouble sitting still before you. Please forgive me for my restlessness. Forgive me for putting my agenda before yours. Help me to listen with unclogged ears and a focused and attentive mind to what you want to teach me today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.